Ozana in the highest let a king be lifted high. Oh, Hosanna. The Lord will bless you. Hosanna. And in the highest. Let our King be lifted high. Let my King be lifted high. Oh, Hosanna. Let our King be lifted high. Oh, Hosanna. Our Father, we lift you high today. We realize every day that without you we can do nothing. But Father, with you we can do all things. And so Father, today we humbly bow before you. And asking you that you lead us all the way, even in this study today, in the mighty name of Jesus, open our hearts, inscribe your word, cause your word to come alive in us and cause us to live by your words today in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I yield to you. I pray that you have your way and speak through my vocals in the name of Jesus and let your people be blessed in the precious name of Jesus we have prayed. Amen. Brethren, how are we all doing? It's another CIBS. Trust God has been good to us. We bless God for yet another day in the land of the living. Um, today's CIBS is still over the weeks. Um, we have been building on what Pastor has been teaching us. Pastor A.K. continued along that line last week and and so we have just been building around the training in righteousness and i intend to also flow along that path today and so for topic i would like us to have today's cibs as the necessity of training in righteousness the necessity of training and righteousness. I first of all like to start by letting us understand the eternal counsel of God that he had from eternity. Now, because if we understand the counsel of God, we will understand why this awesome um, training that pastor is taking us through is very necessary in the life of every man and the life of every woman. Now, from eternity, God had a purpose, and based on that purpose, he established a plan that will enable him to accomplish that purpose that was in his heart. And now, in that purpose, God desired to find expression on the earth that he has created. And now, in order for God to find expression on the face of the earth, now, what God did was God decided to come himself and live in man so that he can find himself finding expression through man. And so, at the end of the day, God's desire was to have an entity that could, that could receive him, an entity that he could feel. Now, if you look at every other creation of God, it's only man that has the spirit amongst all other creation. Other creations have other dimensions. Some of them have emotions that they express. So they have soul and they have their bodies, but it's only man that God created and God put a spirit. And now God did that because of his eternal counsel, because of his eternal purpose, 
him wanting to walk himself into man so that through man he can express himself the way he wants. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. You see, it doesn't matter how close you are to me. Like my wife, my wife apparently will be the closest person to me uh, on earth today and then perhaps my children. Now, but it doesn't matter how close these people are to me. They cannot know the thoughts of my mind. They may not know what is in my heart except and unless I express it. And so God understanding also that the only way that the expressions in his heart can find manifestation is by he himself giving the expression of what is in his heart through a body. And that was the reason why he needed to come and we call that incarnation. And so in the incarnation, God came himself and after he came, he died and he resurrected and became a life-giving spirit and found his way into us. And that's why if you read the Bible, the Bible will tell you the Lord is the spirit. Now God found his way into you, find his way into I, because God's desire is to find expression through us. Now, please follow me because this is going to form the basis. A clear understanding of this will form the basis of everything, will form the basis of this training in righteousness, why you will see it's very necessary for you and it's very necessary for me. Now, so for the accomplishment of his eternal economy, God created a spirit in us that he may dispense himself into us and begin to express himself the way he wants. I'd just like us to see a few scriptures and uh, to, to explain this very thing that I'm talking about. Now, just give me 1 Corinthians. Let me just read 1 Corinthians um, 15 verse 45, uh, where the Bible tells us there that God himself became, I say, and so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, the last Adam, being the very Christ, became a life-giving spirit after he resurrected from the dead. And now when he became the life-giving spirit, now he could tabernacle in your spirit. Remember I said that of everything that God created, man happens to be the only one that has the spirit. Now that spirit that man has is like a container, the bucket that God desires to dispense himself into so that man can retain God in him. And now the reason why God wants you and I to retain him is so that he will find his expression through you now like uh, one day he told me he said son if i want you to still be living by your thoughts and by your mind and by your wit i wouldn't have given you my spirit the reason why i gave you my spirit is because i want my spirit to lead you and that's why the bible said those that are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god let's continue in this now so God's desire from the beginning is to have himself fill you and fill me to the point of overflowing so that he may be able to manifest through us. Now, the life which God wants us to live is not merely a life of holiness that is without uncleanness, but a life of being filled with and saturated with Christ. Thank God for holiness. Thank God for, um, for doing things in a particular way that is without any flaw and all of that. But if that thing is not um, emanating from the life that has saturated you, being Christ himself or his spirit that has saturated you, that is overflowing in your inside, God has no satisfaction from that. And so God wants 
himself to fill us and by filling us, he now will begin to overflow through us. So we have to be filled and saturated with Christ so that he will overflow and manifest in all that we do. And that's why if you read the book of Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles you will see from chapter to chapter, chapter to chapter, Acts would always talk about, and they being filled, uh, they would speak, they being filled, this would happen because God's desire is that out of that flow, out of that feeling, then everything that we would do will flow. In other words, it's not us that is now living or doing, it's the one that has filled us in the inside, finding expression in the outside. Let's see Acts chapter number 2 verse number four let's read some of the scriptures in art and he said and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak they did not speak before the feeling they spoke after the feeling because the desire of heaven is that every action that we're going to take is going to be precipitated from the spirit i said and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now see Acts 4, 8 and 31. Acts 4, 8 and 31. Here he said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and of el and elders of Israel, Peter would not speak until there is that feeling. Now, the reason why God desires that man will be filled by him because he wants every action of man to be by him, through him, for him. Let's see that Acts 4.31. Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaking. Continue. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They spoke the word of God with boldness. If they speak the word of God without the feeling of the Holy Spirit, it will amount to nothing because it is not God's plan that man will act of his own by himself without the feeling, the saturation, the manifestation of the indwelling one. Let's read some other scriptures. Acts chapter number 13, verse number 52. Acts 13, verse number 52. And he said something. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You will see that it's God's plan, that feeling, you will see that it is necessary because it is out of that feeling, out of that indwelling, out of that saturation of the spirit that everything must and should happen because that is the divine plan. That's the plan of God to run this economy. It's going to run by his spirit in man. It's going to run by the indwelling being in us. It's not going to run by your wit, by your idea or any other thing. Give me Acts chapter number 6 verse number 3. See something interesting here. Therefore, brethren, seek out from amongst you. Now, look at what they are saying. Seek out from amongst you seven men of good report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom who may be appointed over this business. There is no way you will do the Lord's business in this testament without being filled because the plan in this economy is that it is the Holy Spirit that will precipitate every action that will take place now. Remember, we are talking about the necessity of being trained in righteousness. We're going somewhere. And let's see at the thing, verse number nine. That's the last scripture that I'll read there. Now I said, then Saul, who also called, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Paul looked intently at him, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke Paul did not speak of himself. Paul did not speak by himself. But being filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke. Now every action in the New Testament by believers 
ought to be, should be precipitated by the Holy Spirit, meaning that the Holy Spirit must be the pivot. Christ in you must be the one that leads every action because that is the way the Lord has designed it. A proper Christian living is a life in which we live by the living person within us. Hear me, brothers and sisters. The proper Christian life is a life in which we live by the living one in us. It's the living one in us that lives through us. Little one that Apostle Paul would say, no longer I. And now we must understand that that is what this Christian living is all about. Now, if we would live the life of Christ, we must live this life by the Christ that is in us. Now, in the New Testament, it's not just about God with us. Brothers, this is critical. This is critical. Now, it's not just about God. We remember Isaiah said and prophesied in Isaiah 7 verse number 14, it said, a virgin will conceive and bring forth. And he said, you will call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. You find that in Isaiah 14. And somewhere in Exodus, Moses was saying, Exodus 28, verse 25, verse 8. God there instructed, build me a tabernacle that I may dwell with my people. But brothers and sisters, in this testament, they said, and let them make me a sanctuary. Some other versions will say tabernacle that I may dwell with my people. Now, God in the Old Testament dwelt with his people, dwelt amongst his people. But in the New Testament, God Change gear from just dwelling amongst to dwelling in. And you will find out the reason why that is necessary. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 8, 7 to 11. Now, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them... He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Let's pause there. Now, I was saying in the Old Testament, Covenant in the Old Testament, God was with them, but even though God was with them, it was not sufficient to bring them into the place that God was taking them to. Because here the Bible said he took them by the hand, in order he took them by the hand, brought them out of Egypt. His intention was to take them into the promised land, but a lot of them wasted that carcass in the wilderness as a a matter of fact, out of 600,000 men, only two entered the promised land regardless of the fact that God took them by the hands. And so I'll, I'll continue reading. I said, say, he said, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them says the Lord, 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall say Teach his neighbor. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother say, Know the Lord for all will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now, 
in this testament, what God did is that God himself came into man, came into us, and within the inside of us is now inscribing and circumscribing his law in our heart. And therefore, no one would need to say, teach the other anything concerning the Lord. Why? You have the anointing of the Holy One and you need no one to teach you because that same anointing that abides in you teaches you. And so in this testament, God now dwells in us because that is the divine plan that God has all, all through eternity have desired, that he will live in us and therefore live through us. Like I said, I was trying to explain, it doesn't matter how close a man is to you, no man, the Bible tells us, knows what is in the heart of a man except the spirit of that man. And so no other person knows what is in the mind of God except the spirit of God. And so when the spirit of God dwells in a man, the spirit of God that dwells in a man will reveal to that man what is in the heart of God because now that man is co-mingled with God. We have become one with God and so we are not just mere men again. We are divine beings because we have the divine spirit within us. This is the plan that heaven has for man's life and man's living. Now, listen to me. Now, it's very critical that we understand this, that the outward expression of any man or any woman is a function of what is formed in the inside of the man. And so if you see a man that is producing the deeds of unrighteousness, it's because of the seed or the deeds of unrighteousness that is formed in the inside of the man. It is what is in the inside that appears in the outside. And now if you see a man that his deeds are the deeds of righteousness, it's because of the being of righteousness that is in the inside of the man. And that is why it is critical critical that we understand the divine plan and the necessity of God taking us through this training. And therefore, so for us to produce the seed of righteousness, for us to live the way that we should, then there is a divine being inside of us that will propel us to live in the way that we should. Else we'll be like the children of Israel. We may know all the laws, but yet we'll not be able to live them because we are not living by the one that is in the inside. Now, this foundation that I laid is very critical in us understanding why training in righteousness is very crucial and very critical. Now, why is God going to train you? Why is God going to train me? Now, God is going to train you because first and foremost, his desire is that you will be like him. You know, pastor has told us no training, no reigning. And so uh, if he does not train you, you cannot reign with him. And so God's desire is that you would be like him. You cannot be like him if he does not take you through the same paths that he took. Give me John chapter number 13, verse 16. Let us read some of the scriptures. John 13, verse 16. Let's read. Here Jesus was speaking and, and Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Remember somewhere in John chapter number 17, verse number 18, he has said to us, As the uh, Father has sent me, so I have sent you. And now he's telling you, you are not greater than your master that is sending you. Let's read this 
scriptures, you will understand why this training and righteousness is necessary. John 15, I'll read 18 to 27. Now, here he reads. This is Jesus speaking. Remember, he said, a servant is not greater than his master. And if you, we didn't have time to read the entire John 13 from the beginning, you will find out that that story, in that story, Jesus was telling them about the things that he has done for them that they too should do for themselves. And he, start, he started to wash their feet. Remember, Peter said something. He said, God forbid you would not wash me. And he told Peter, he said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part in me. And now he got to that point and he says to them, the servant is not greater than his master. Now, hear him speak in John 15, verse number 18. If the word hates you, you know that he hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. Referring to that word that he spoke to them in John chapter number 13. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you keep my words, they will, if you keep my words, they will keep yours also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. Now, Jesus was saying something. He said, he's saying that the experiences that he went through, we as his disciples, we indeed go through the same experiences. Now, let's see the Matthew version of that because I'm saying something. I'm saying that part of the reason why you have to be trained in righteousness is so that you will become like him. Matthew chapter number 10, let's read 24 and 25. A disciple is not above his teacher. Now, this Matthew's version a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Now, this is what he now says. It is enough for a disciple that he will be like his teacher and a servant like his master. It is sufficient. It is enough that you would be like your master. You would be like your teacher. And therefore, you will pass through the pathways of your teacher and pass through the pathways of your master in order that you will come to that place where you will be like your master and be like your teacher. Let's see how Luke puts it in Luke chapter number 6 verse 40. Luke 6 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained, everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. That is the reason why God will take you to training in righteousness, because he wants you to be like, his, like him himself. He wants you to be like your teacher. He wants you to be like your master, and therefore he will take you through training in righteousness. Let's see the book of Hebrews. Let's see the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number. Hebrews chapter number 12. 5 to 11. Training is necessary. If you are not trained. You are illegitimate the Bible says. And you have. It said, and you have forgotten the exaltation which speaks to you as to sons. What is that exaltation? My son, do not despise the chastening of your Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loved, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there who a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not a son. 
There, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and life? For they indeed for a few days testing us had seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness." Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceful fruit of peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There is a fruit that comes from our training. And now that true, that fruit is called the fruit of righteousness. Let me read this in Philip's translation. In this all, in this all out much against sin, others have suffered far worse than you, to say nothing of what Jesus went through, all that bloodshed. So don't feel sorry for yourself. Or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God regards you as his children? My dear children, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It is the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. God is educating you. That is why you must never drop out. He's treating you as a dear, as dear children. Now, the, this trouble you're in isn't punishment. Now, note this word. He said, this trouble that you're in isn't punishment. He said, it's training. The normal experience of children only irresponsible parents leave children to fend for themselves. Would you prefer an irresponsible God? We respect our parents for training and not spoiling us. So why not embrace God's training so we can truly live? While we were children, our parents did what seemed best to them. But God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always seems like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely for it's the whole, it's the world trade, it's for the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. It is the well-trained who finds themselves mature in their relationship with God. And so the whole essence of the training is to bring you to the place where you're mature in your relationship with God. He said it is not punishment. It is not punishment that God will take you through the path of training in righteousness. Friends, why are we why is it necessary that God would train you in righteousness? Now, we have said that God's desire is to bring us to a particular place, is to bring us to the place where he begins to live through us, that that is the divine plan of God. Now, if God is going to live through you, then it is very necessary that you would surrender and submit to him in order that, you will, that he will live through you. And therefore, God is going to train you so that you come to that place where you submit to him so that he will be able to live, live his life through you. Let's see the scriptures. James 4, 6, verse number 7. It's on the basis, it's on this basis that you would find 
the life of a believer being able to establish things in God. Now, in James 4, chapter number 6, it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Who is the humble? Before we go, who is the humble? The humble is the one that submits himself to the dealings of the Lord. The humble is the one that takes the part of God's discipline. That's a humble man. He said that particular humble man, God will give grace to such a man and God will resist those that are proud. And in verse 7 here, he says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Therefore submit to God. Now, if we submit to the discipline of God, we get to that place where we become strong men and strong women that can resist the devil. Now, essence of, of we going through this training is that a man comes to that place where he has no longer struggled with God. He has yielded everything to God. There is no place in him that is standing in the way in what God wants to do. That is the essence why God takes children, his children through the training. He takes us through the training to get us out of the way so that he can have his way through us. He brings you to the place where you submit absolutely to him. Remember the case of Paul. Paul was telling us in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, he was telling us the story of the thorn in his flesh. Now, in that particular story, the desire of God was, Paul, I do not want you to live by your strength. I want you to live by my strength. And now in order for you, Paul, to live by my strength, this thorn is there. Paul was crying about the thorn, but it was a discipline in righteousness so that Paul would come to the place where Paul is no longer living by himself and by his strength, but Paul comes to the place where he lives by the strength that is from God. Give me 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12. Let's read from verse number 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. <laughs> I will come to visions and to revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up in the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows how he was caught up in paradise and had inexpressible words, which it is unlawful for a man to utter. Now of such a man I will boast, yet of myself I would not boast except in my infirmities. Now, now Paul has infirmities, we'll see why the dealings of infirmity is necessary for this man. He said, for though I might desire to boast, I would not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain. He said, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. He said, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, a messenger of Satan. Sometimes the things that you're going through, sometimes the principalities, sometimes the powers, sometimes the things that God allows us go through. It's not because he doesn't have strength or it's not because you're weak in your prayers or you're weak as a son or a child of God. No, sometimes the things that you're going through is because God wants to bring you to the place where you no longer live by yourself, but now live by the living one that is in the in side of you. He said, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. He said, least I be exalted above measure. 
Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so I want us to understand that God will bring us through certain pathways so that we'll come to the place where we submit to him, we yield to him, we surrender to him so that the living one in us will begin to find expression out of us. Remember I said that is the design. That's the reason why you are filled with the Holy Spirit. God did not fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you will still be figuring things yourself. He filled you with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will live through you. But if you have not learned to submit to the Holy Spirit, if you have not gone through the school where you learn to submit to the Holy Spirit, you will still be living and permit permuting things with your mind and with your head. Why would God also take you through this training? God will take you through this training because God desires that you abide in Him. Now your fruitfulness is paramount. It is important to heaven. God desires that you bear fruit. And but for you to bear fruit, you need to abide in him. In John chapter number 15, Jesus tells us about abiding in him. Let's read John chapter number 15, 1 to 7. John 15, 1 to 7. Our life comes from him. He is the source of our life. And so we need of necessity to abide in him so that we can receive strength from him. There can be a flow from him by the abiding in him. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruits. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are born. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. Desire of heaven is that the children of God will bear fruit and for us to bear fruit, we need to abide in him. And so he will take us through a training that will teach us how to abide in him. We will go through training in righteousness and we will come to that place where we learn to abide in him. Friends, there are situations and circumstances that will come the way of a send. All they come to do is to teach you to abide. Is to teach you to abide that there is life in the Lord and that life flows from him and if i abide in him i will have a rich supply of his life i would not be dry in my christian faith i would not come to the point where i despair i despair because 
because I'm abiding in him. It doesn't matter the storms that is all around me. Because I'm abiding in him, I will be fruitful because I'm abiding in him. He has a divine economy that is not that does not take his definition uh, from your government, that does not take its bearing from the permutations of the economists in the world. No, we are abiding in him. There is something that flows from him to sustain the saint in the faith. And so God would take me and teach me the art of abiding in him. And you know in this scripture Jesus said something. Abide in my word and I in you. We abide. When we abide in the word of God, we abide in him. When we abide in the word of God, we abide in him. Remember in John chapter number 1, Jesus said, in John 1, the Bible said, and the beginning was the word, and it said in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. The, the word was with God and the word was God. So when you are abiding in the word, you are abiding in him because he is the word and the word is him. And so when you abide in the word, you are abiding in him. You know, he said in, 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 in John chapter number 14, in John 1 14, he said something. Uh, he talked about, he said, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. The word became flesh. Now see John chapter number 6 and 56 and 57. Let's see something in John 6. It said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. And now this flesh, he has told us he is the flesh, the word that became flesh. That word is the very Christ. When we abide in the word of God, we abide abide in God and so God will take us through the disciplines of bringing us to abide in his word because in his word is our flow of life. Let me show us another thing about abide, abiding in him. 1 John 2 27. It said, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as that same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Let's see this verse in NLT. Let's see it in NLT. You will understand what he's saying about abiding in him. Now I read. He said, but you have received the Holy Spirit. In the other place, he said, the anointing which you have received. Now here's the interpretation. He said, but you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches you is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. So when... You stay under the teaching of the Holy Spirit. You abide in Christ. The anointing that teaches you. The Holy Spirit's teaching helps you to abide in Christ. And so the things that the Father will bring us, He will bring us through the trainings of the Spirit, the teachings of the Holy Spirit. He will do that so that you will abide in Christ and in abiding in Christ, you will be fruitful. The reason for fruitlessness 
in Christianity today is because we are not living by the living one in the inside of us. By the teachings, the admonitions of the Holy Spirit, by the instructions, by the guidance, the leadings of the Holy Spirit. That's why we are barren. That's why we are not bearing fruit as should be. Because the Holy Spirit that is in us will teach us. And when we abide, we are abiding in Christ. And the Bible says if we abide in him, we will bear fruit. We will move from just bearing fruit to more fruit to much fruit. Because we are abiding in him. So I've told us about submission. The Holy Spirit will train you in righteousness so that you will learn to abide in Christ. He will train you in righteousness so that you will learn to submit to him in all the things that you do. Now he will train you also that you will come to the place where you would throw away your will. The Holy Spirit will train you so that you come to the place where you are done with yourself and with your will. He brings you to that place where you do not rely on yourself again. He brings you to that place where you, for no reason, you don't want anything to do with the self-life. You just want to live by him. Now give me 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And let's see God's training Paul in this place. 2 Corinthians 11, 1, 1 to 11. Paul, an apostle of Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achai. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and of God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will be partakers but you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond the measure, above strength, so that we despised even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that will still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on behalf for the gift granted, to us through many. Now see what Paul said. Now God brought Paul to the place where they would not trust themselves. And so when God is training you, he brings you to the place where you would not trust any further yourself so that you would only depend on the living one in your inside. So that you come to the place where you know that, hey, I can do nothing. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ. He brings you to that particular place. And so he will bring you to the place where you, your will, 
your self-life, everything, you will come to the end of your will, come to the end of your self-life, and now you will say, not my will, your will be done. You remember when Jesus got to that place in the, in, in, in the garden, Jesus three times, the pressure was there, the push was there, three times he prayed, and at the end of the day, he ended saying, not my will, but your will be done, because in the kingdom that you have been called, it is his will and his will alone. And he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And so God will walk you the path of righteousness, bring you to the end of yourself, and bring you to the end of your will, so that it will only be his will that is living and working in you. Friends, even as I run off this today, The desire of God is to live through you. But if you don't surrender, if you don't submit to him, he cannot. If you still enjoy your desires, your will, then he cannot. If you are not abiding in him, then he cannot. And so God will take us through this journey so that we'll come to the end of our will, come to the end of ourself, so that we will come to the place where it doesn't matter what is happening, we abide in him. He will take us through this path because he wants us to be like him. The servant is not greater than his master. But it is sufficient that that master servant will be like his master. And so he will take you through that pathway that will make you at the end of the day, you will be like him. For as the father has sent him, so he's sending you. He wants you to be like him. We will stop here today. There are so many other reasons why God wants to train us in righteousness. As pastor continues to give us this training, brothers and sisters, let our ears be open. Let our eyes see and let our understanding be fruitful. As these things are coming, you need to be asking your father and your maker and say, Lord, help me. The training would not be in futility. Help me that the things that you desire for me to learn, it is not punishment because it's the act of the love of the Father to train so that we will bring that peaceful fruit, fruit of righteousness. Our Father and our God will thank you today. Lord, it is clear in your word that it's the one that the Father loves that he trains that he disciplines. And Father, the desire is not to punish us, but the desire is that at the end of the day, we will begin to bear the fruit of right living. Lord, as you continue to train us in righteousness, Lord, we'll pray that we will get to the point where we will yield everything to you, where we will say no longer I, but you, O oh God, where we would not stand in your way, nor stand in your path, O oh God. Father, we, Lord Jehovah, will come to the place where we submit totally to you. Where we say, no longer our will, but your will be done. Help us, O oh God, to learn to abide in you, so that we will be fruitful all seasons, O oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, blessed be your name, our Father, for in Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Brothers and sisters, till we see you again, remain in the warm hands of the Almighty. God bless you. Amen.